So uh, I know I need to do a very good job to fight against this uh, food coma. I know it was very good laksa, very good curry just now, right? So please stay with me. I'll try to make this as interesting, as fun as possible. Um, so my name is Keith. Um, I'm head of product design at Carousel. So like I say I try not to talk, I try not to talk about Carousel today, because uh, it's not about Carousel. Um, and this is um, this is like a, the path that I've taken. So also not going to talk about it too much. But in preparing for this talk, I did have to uh, do a lot of uh, retro. Uh, into like what has brought me here so far and the experiences I have with uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, throughout my career. So today I want to talk about smart because uh, I was told that the, uh, the theme is emerging technology. So I thought, you know, with all this talk about smart nation, uh, self-driving cars, um, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, uh, critical time for us to think about what smart is. I want to talk about artificial intelligence, which is uh, the thing being smart, um, versus feeling smart, which is the uh, the users, the the emotions this technology leaves us, uh, the users, uh, with. Uh, do we feel smart, or maybe not? I don't know. It's it's a question for us to to answer. So today, um, I only have stories to tell. I don't have a lot to share. Uh, so I'm going to tell you. Um, I'm going to deliver this talk through four personal stories I have uh, working in AI or alongside of AI uh, throughout my career. So um, I cannot guarantee that everyone will walk out in this walk out of this room feeling smarter today, uh, but I just hope that uh, we can look at artificial intelligence from a more human-centered lens. So the first. Uh, the first story I have to tell is uh, this thing called radar, uh, and what it stands for is uh, reflective agents with distributed adaptive reasoning. Uh, I didn't come up with this acronym. Uh, some guy in uh, some government agency did that. Uh, I'm very impressed with this guy. Uh, um, and this was back in 2000 and 2002, like, so more than 10 years ago. Um, and today we we call this thing Siri or OK Google. Uh, so it's essentially the same thing, but back then uh, there was no such technology. Uh, so the team that worked on this actually later on moved on to work on uh, Siri, uh, not me lah. So we, we, we were asked to, as a, as a researcher, I was asked to do some studies on how people will interact with uh, an AI bot uh, without the AI bot itself. So back then we, the technology was not ready, but we were asked to do a study on it. Uh, so we did this thing called Wizard of Oz study. Uh, who is familiar with this technique? Uh, okay, some of you are here. Great. Um, so for those who are not so familiar with Wizard of Oz, right, it means uh, that we actually have to fake some things to make uh, to cheat the users. Like we make the user believe that there is something going on, but actually um, there isn't anything. So we ask the user to uh, email this uh, smart agent to do some stuff like schedule meetings, book rooms. Uh, update some websites, etc. Uh, and what happened was that we were hiding behind the one-way mirror and doing all these tasks. Uh, so, but we, we make them believe that there was some smart agent um, uh, do, running all these background tasks. And for some of the tasks, we did it correctly. And for some of the other tasks, we were very evil. We purposely do it wrongly so that we can observe how people behave. We want to piss them off. We want to see you know, where's the breaking point. And what was, what was interesting about this uh, study was that um, we noticed that people were very polite uh, to this agent. They, they were used like, oh, good afternoon, or can you, uh, sorry, can you do this for me? Uh, when we clearly told them that this is a bot. Uh, and after the, after the experiment, right, we had this interview with them. And I was also very surprised that they were referring to this bot as a he or a she. When all we did was just email comms. So there was no audio cues, there was no visual cues. So I don't know why people will give this bot a gender um, based on whatever preference they have. So in, in, in interacting with this smart technology, although I mean it's, it's, not, it's not really real, lah, but then uh, we were able to have a sneak preview to like um, when the, this technology is ready, how will people uh, uh, react, uh, interact with it. And we realized that all people wanted to do was to feel normal. 
um, they want to ignore the fact that they want they are interacting with this uh, this bot. So you know, they come up with uh, all this like politeness. They are, and in fact, they were also a bit tolerant with these mistakes. Uh, so when when we ex uh, when we purposely commit something wrong, like book the wrong room, book the wrong time, um, people were, uh, the people were surprisingly quite tolerant with this uh, technology. And it, it made us realize that the AI bot doesn't have to be perfect uh, because because people can uh, can uh, tolerate lah. In Singlish, we say tahan a little bit. Um, of course, of course, this is not like self-driving cars where you know we don't kill we don't kill people. So I think that, that tolerance have to be viewed in that in that context. And actually, I'll sum up this story. Uh, so every story got got like some kind of learning like morals. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling stories. Um, so the. I will sum up this story with this quote. I forgot who said it, but it's the best technology is invisible. And I think uh, we do need to think about when we design for artificial intelligence, how, how can we make it invisible? How can we make it so natural for people that it doesn't feel like they're interacting with a bot? Um, in, um, in, in movies, in, uh, in UX, we have this term called uh, suspension of disbelief. So we, people want to imagine that they are in a normal state. So then how can we... Um, how can we help them realize this uh, suspension of disbelief as long as possible? The, the second story I want to tell is uncanny. And I also realized that yesterday you guys heard about the uncanny valley. So this is exactly the same thing. Um, so in case uh, some of y'all were not here yesterday uh, morning, the uncanny valley is about how realistic you portray um, this, this uh, artificial intelligence bot. So the nearer, um, th there is this valley here where you know, when, you, when you're kind of approximate towards looking like a human being but not quite there yet, you actually drop into this valley of uh, making people feel uncomfortable. So something like a cartoon, it's like kind of here. Obviously you know that it's not human but you can relate, you're comfortable with it. Uh, a healthy person is all the way here. So this is best explained with uh, this movie back in uh, 2001. Uh, maybe some of y'all are too young, uh, but this is Final Fantasy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> the spirits within. Um, so it was like the, the CG was cutting edge at that point, right? Uh, in, at, at that moment. But then these were, the, these were the reviews given by The Guardian, by Rolling Stone, you know, about things looking really like, freaky because they are almost there but not quite there. And talking about you know like the eyes, you, know, you basically see a glaze over the eyes. It's like, like there's certain coldness uh, in in these characters. But then you look at SpongeBob. SpongeBob is obviously not human, but you know we can laugh with it. We can, um, you know, we can feel something about SpongeBob. Obviously, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously not human. And there's theories behind you know when something is not human, right? You actually find any kind of human qualities inside quite refreshing, quite novel, and we and you can actually build a relationship with this thing and even have empathy towards it. Whereas when something is, um, looks like human but not quite there yet, um, you actually judge it by human standards. You actually think that this is a human that failed to be a human. <laughs> like doing a very terrible job. Uh, and it's the biggest insult you can give a human being, right? Uh, and, and, and because of that, you know, we, we notice that it's, it's soulless. It's almost like death you know, in your face. And this, that makes us feel very uncomfortable. So I, I put SpongeBob here. <laughs> I'm quite comfortable with SpongeBob. Not sh I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, you guys are. Um, I put Sophia the robot here. A bit, a bit freaky. Um, it, it just makes, uh, makes me feel weird. And in the, in the earlier example, that the email bot that, I, that we were faking, I actually put it, uh, I put it somewhere here. Because um, I don't have a face for it, it's just email comms, and the whole the whole reaction feels very very natural. So people don't even have to imagine what this. Probably uh, the the person who gave the bot a he or a she has some imagination of how this person look, and it's as human as this person wants to be. So I don't even have to define it. So in, in talking about like AI, how we feel scared in front of AI, right? I think the, the pro tip I have here is um, 
if you if you can avoid giving your AI bot a face, avoid so because you can. You it's very hard to get it right. Uh, never aim for that kind of accuracy, that kind of realism. Oops. Um, okay, who is old enough to know this? Okay. <laughs> um, so this is this is uh, Microsoft Clippy. He is, I, I would say, one of the grandfathers la, of AI bot. Um, not doing a very good job. Um, uh, back then, you know, uh, in the 1990s, right? I, I guess it's around that time. Uh, if you are like typing your word document or preparing a, uh, your PowerPoint presentation, like, Clippy will appear and, and, and ask you like, "Oh, looks like you are trying to edit a document. Can I help you?" Or, "Oh, looks like you are trying to do this. Can I help you?" And it was super, super annoying. Um, but the but I think the fact that it didn't have a human face, it never tried to look human, right? We were never scared of it. We were very, very annoyed with it, for sure, but we were never, we were never scared of it. So I think this underpins the point of uh, really think about when you try to, uh, what's that word, anthropomorphize uh, your AI bot. Really think about how you, what kind of human qualities you want to give your bot and how do you, exp how do you deliver these qualities. It doesn't have to be a human face. It can be done in many other ways. Okay, moving on to my third story here. Um, it's about warehouse, the warehouse robots. So I'm showing, I'm showing a video of Amazon here because um, it's the easiest video for me to explain uh, what, what these bots are doing. So I'm sure a lot of people here know, this, uh, know about this Amazon bot. So I, I had a chance to visit a friend who was building something uh, like these robots uh, in some other country. Uh, so I'm trying to protect his identity you know, so that it's anonymous. But um, they were basically building uh, this kind of Kiva, uh, the Kiva robots uh, in the warehouse. Um, and he had a client, and the, his client was very nice to give him, a, to carve out a, a space in the warehouse to, to build a proof of concept. So he invited me to go down to, to look at you know, the operations and you know, kind of give some ideas. So we, we all know that um, before, this, before warehouses have these robots, the workers have to walk very, very long distances every day. Um, I think some studies showed that the, an Amazon warehouse worker has to walk as much as like, 21 kilometers a day, just uh, picking items, uh, preparing the packages you know, that we order online. Um, and 21 kilometers, that's like running a half marathon every day. <laughs> uh, I don't know about y'all, but I don't think I can do that. Um, so these robots you know, bring the shelf to you and you just need to stay in one spot and do all this picking. Uh, so you, you, you don't really have to move, her, right? you just need to, uh, the, the goods come to you, you, you prep this shipment uh, and everyone's life is better. So I was, I was, so, I was sitting there um, you know, chatting with my friend, hey look at all the, the, the mechanical movements you know, this worker needs to have, you know, like the twist and the turn. Know, how can we design this picking station to minimize uh, this repeated movement? So, you know, like going down to the details to make life better for the, the workers here. <coughs> uh, so, this is also not a picture of the warehouse worker. All these are stock images. Um, so, then, like, as, we, as we were talking, right, I saw that a lot of, uh, a lot of the workers in the warehouse, um, they, are, the operations, they are still running the normal operations. Um, they will walk past us every now and then, and then like, look at those robots with uh, curiosity and with a lot of fear uh, it's, it's written on their face and very possibly right I think the upper management had not told them that we are running this uh, proof of concept um, but from this very elaborate setup uh, the, the space was probably about this big um, like robots moving around like it sure looked like we were we were like there to take away their jobs uh, so they, they don't look very friendly and I think in, in, the pres in this case, like in the presence of this technology, uh, people feel threatened. So I, um, I think in, in this case, I, I, do talk to, I, I do talk to my friend and say like, hey, you know, um, we are, you're doing this thing, you're actually improving people's lives, but it doesn't look like, it, it doesn't look like so. Um, and then I, I, I think like, <laughs> I always use this example because uh, I think as designers, right, uh, or as engineers, you know, we have great power to disrupt industries, to disrupt people's lives. Um, and with this great power comes great responsibility. So you know, I was telling my friend, like, hey, um, I know that we are trying to improve people's lives, uh, but in thinking about 
just warehouse automation, can we also think about how do we design uh, the jobs of the future? Uh, and it's, it's not so much about, uh, so there's a bigger problem out there to be solved. Uh, now that you're solving this automation problem, is there, like, do we want to work on a bigger problem in thinking about the future of jobs for warehouse workers? So in thinking about, uh, uh, and positioning this, um, that this, this whole initiative as free training, improving people's lives. Still, we will, uh, we will still go ahead with this warehouse automation, but then it's really uh, a redesign of the jobs that we, are, we also need to look at. Like how do we retrain people um, to move from like, walking shelf to shelf to like, staying put and uh, doing all this uh, e-commerce fulfillment? So then this is, uh, this is the fourth story I have. Um, I realize I'm going quite fast, so you can stop me if you have any questions. Uh, so at some point in my, in my career, right, I'm, I work with some counter-terrorism analysts. It's actually quite a, a very interesting part in my life, um, working on counter-terrorism. So I realized that uh, when I work with this, terror, uh, this terrorist, <laughs> When I work with these analysts, um, <laughs> I learned that they read a lot of newspapers every day. Um, they, so like they will read like, maybe like just given like one bombing incident, right? They want to read it from, uh, from Straits Times, from the New York Times, from like all sorts of media outlets to kind of piece together you know, the different aspects of the story. Um, so the number of articles that they read every day is humongous. And so we thought like, hey, let's build something to help them. Uh, do, do, to read as many as possible. So we built this thing, um, this also built long ago, la. almost like a spam filter, but basically you can, you can create folders where you specify these are the topics of interest. Um, I, I mean, in counter-terrorism, there's probably things like bombings and, I don't know, uh, gas attacks and one. I don't know what their topics are. Um, but then they create these this topics and then um, uh, these this folders, and then all they need to do is to train these folders to pick up the, the articles that, they are rele that is relevant to their area of uh, uh, kind of like purview. Um, so machine learning, right? So machine learning has positive learning, has negative learning. Uh, to, to teach, to give the, to train these folders with positive learning, you just need to add 20 articles. And then to, to train them uh, in the negative ex examples, you need to let these folders run for some time, then the, the algorithm might make some mistakes, and then the analyst will have to take out this, uh, these articles. Um, and what happened uh, at the end of the proof of concept, right, was that the analyst told us that uh, it's just cannot, I, I think I need to spend more time uh, telling the, the folders what are the wrong articles than the folders actually helping me uh, save time. So actually, um, throughout this whole study, um, the, uh, I would say none of the analysts made through the negative learning stage. The positive learning stage was very, e was very easy. They can easily find 10, 20 articles that is relevant to save uh, bombing and then just put it into the folder. But to, keep, but to have to keep train, telling the, uh, the algorithm that they are making mistakes, somehow the patients wear off at the number four, number five articles. Uh, and they feel like this is wasting their time. So perhaps, I think, in, in retrospect, um, the technology wasn't that good back then, so that uh, you know, we, we made a lot of mistakes and we required that 20 negative learning examples. Um, perhaps we could have made training a bit more effortless. We could have downgraded the, what, the, what the AI was doing to just purely recommendation. Uh, we could have added this, something like this, you know, at the end of each article where we just recommend the folder. Um, and then if the user thinks that this is the right suggestion, no, they add it in. If they think it's the wrong suggestion, they don't add it in. And through this inaction, we actually learn that oh, this, is, this is not right. So then the negative learning is actually more effortless. So a lot of my, my users, uh, you know, the, the comment uh, you know, they, they gave me at the end of this testing phase is that you know, I felt very stupid you know, using your, your stupid AI agent. Uh, <laughs> Um, which is, which is, which is I, I don't blame them. I, I really value this kind of uh, very honest, candid feedback uh, to us as designers. You know, we, have the, we have the best intent to improve their workflow, but we, we don't realize that uh, we end up making their life a bit more miserable, their work life more miserable. 
<coughs> so I, 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 in, and then in reflecting on this experience, this project, I actually went back to my textbook uh, to find this uh, chart. Um, so it's a very good textbook. It's called An Introduction to Human Factors Engineering by Wickens, Lee, Liu, and Becker. Um, basically, it lays out the, lev the different levels of automation um, we, we can have. Uh, and then the, the appropriate amount of trust we need to accord at each level of automation. I mean, this is nothing new. This, we had this since the, uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have, you know, when the AI is like, really, really very, very bad, like useless, you have human in complete control. And then on the far, on the far right side, you have uh, where the AI is super good, um, the bot actually ignores the human, and the human cannot veto the bot. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have anything at this stage yet uh, where we allow the, the machine to decide everything and humans can't intervene. Uh, but then there's a whole slew of like, different uh, stages you know, in between. I think what happens is that we were, <coughs> we were aiming for this stage you know, that where the bot does it for you and the human can veto. So the bot puts the article into the folder for you and you as a human, you veto, say, hey, this is not right, I take it out. When perhaps, you know, we, we, are, we are better off staying at this level, uh, where the bot pushes one choice. Like, hey, maybe you want to put it in topic five, uh, and then you, you decide whether you want to uh, execute the action. And I'll, I'll say it's very important to get, get this level of trust and automation right, because if there's too little trust, uh, you end up in this stage of distrust um, where you, know, you roll out this thing and your users are not using it. Uh, they ignore all these uh, suggestions coming from them and, and they think that I know better than this machine. Uh, and you also don't want to end up in the other situation where there's overtrust. Like, oh, the, um, I think this, this technology is super good, right? I just need to kick back and relax and let it auto run. Um, so I, I think of it like, say, in autopilot. So we are autopilot for so many years already, right? Um, when, when, the, when, when the AI, when, or when the, end, um, when the aircraft is telling the pilot to do something, like, it needs to have the right amount of distrust and overtrust to, to make sure it, it makes the right decision. Like, most of the aircraft now can go autopilot, but do we feel comfortable if all our pilots go to sleep uh, during, in the middle of the flight? Like, I think, I think that, that, is, that is something that is um, very scary, like, a lot of those. Uh, we, we still think that we need to put a human in the, in the loop. But then if you look at a lot of, of these aircraft uh, accidents that have happened, uh, sometimes uh, pilots do override the, the aircraft suggestions and uh, end up uh, making bad decisions. So I will say that um, there's no, it's, a, it's a very fine line to tread, um, and figuring this out is very important. Okay, the fourth story I have to tell is Carousel. So I know I promised not to promote Carousel today, <laughs> um, but I have to. Huh? <laughs> so uh, just now, actually just now before I chat, someone was asking me, hey, Carousel got AI meh? Um, actually, we do. Uh, it's just that maybe it's not so apparent, not so in your face. After all, it's an it's a, it's a e um, I mean, buy and sell marketplace, so there is still a shopping element to it. So, Things like the, I will say the hygiene factors in, in machine learning will still be there. Like things like say, um, we, you know, we have like recommended collections from, uh, for you, we have recommended items for you, and this, they are all loosely based on your browsing history with us. You know, when we serve ads to you, uh, all this is driven by AI. And uh, also you know, our CRM, you know, we reach out to people, they are, it's all based on like, what we understand about you. I'll, and I will say these are things uh, like, like the hygiene factors. So I also, I, mean, I don't know whether this is considered AI, but it's definitely computer vision. Um, so we are, we are launching um, image search. So you know, take a photo of this pretty dress, and then uh, you're able to find similar pretty dresses on Carousel. Um, still, I, I think like, I still feel that these are still very low bar, like hygiene factors, like, just do it. Um, and ex just experiment and see you know, like, what, what can we learn from these uh, types of features. So what I want to talk about, uh, about Carousel, which I find very interesting like, from an AI point of view, is our smart replies. Um, 
So no, I'm not sure if you all are aware, you know, but sometimes um, when, when you're chatting with your, with your buyer or seller, you know, they ask you this kind of question, like obviously you have written in your listing description and, and they have not read it. Like you say like, hey, um, I can only meet at Serangoon MRT station. And they'll, they'll, they'll still ask you like where to meet. Um, <laughs> so the, the bot will actually um, try to, you know, if, if there's really pre-existing information, the bot will, will try to retrieve it from your description and suggest that, hey, maybe you want to reply with this. I mean, it saves, saves you some uh, seconds, microseconds from typing it out. But what, what I'm fascinated by it is that actually we can train it to do a lot of things. We can train to have some kind of personality. So this does, this does happen. Um, Y'all can try that. Uh, when you, when you, when you lowball someone. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, in, like this has happened before. Like, like, let's say I'm trying to sell something for $100 and I tell this guy, hey, it's non-negotiable. And if this guy tries to lowball me like $50, um, this, is, this is actually, I've seen these suggestions come up before. Uh, and we even played around with it, like, uh, I think on one of the April's Fool's Day, we actually swapped out the language with uh, Singlish. Uh, um, and I think all this, uh, th this feature, I think, um, when done right, right, I think we can feel understood, like personalization, personality in the AI bot, we can feel understood. I'm not saying that Carousel has done everything right, but I'm, I'm just pointing to the, uh, the potential no, if, if we can get uh, something right about personality in, in, the, in the bot, uh, we can make people feel understood in the presence of artificial intelligence. So these are, these are the stories I have to share, uh, four stories. Um, so thank you for kind of staying with me and listening, me being so long-winded, telling you stories, uh, hoping that you, know, you can um, derive some meaning from each of these stories. <coughs> I spent a long time making this animation, so look at it more. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm saying, okay, the purpose of this talk, right, is not so much to bash AI, to say that, hey, AI, it's bad, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, not, it's stupid or whatnot. I think the, the purpose of this talk, right, is for us to pay a lot more attention to how people feel uh, when, you know, when they interact with this technology. And I mean, like, when I say, you no, know, like, they feel stupid, they feel threatened, scared, uh, understood. Um, I don't mean I don't mean to be exhaustive. I think we all need to, as designers, we all need to understand the the emotional impact of uh, artificial intelligence and how do we help people build a relationship uh, towards this technology. And I, and I feel that it's it's possible. i uh, when people start to refer uh, uh, a bot, you know, as a he or a she, actually in, indicates some kind of comfort level. It indicates some some level of empathy we have achieved with this bot. And so how can we create the environment where people you know, can connect with a bot? So I want to end this talk with uh, one last story. So this one is uh, quite a small story. Uh. Um, so back in, back in uni, right, uh, we were also building uh, what we call cognitive tutors. So these are, these are education, uh, online education programs that uh, teach kids, you know, like uh, early, like young kids, uh, like arithmetics and whatnot. And it's all AI driven. Or if, if you keep feeling your uh, mental sums or something like that, um, arithmetic, then you'll just reinforce arithmetic stuff. And you can ask the, the tutor a whole bunch of questions. So during one of these sessions, right, uh, one of the kids was looking very, very upset. Uh, and then the teacher went up to the, to the terminal and, and saw this, like the bot was scolding the, the, the kid. Uh, very, very bad, right? Uh, like why would the bot be so evil? Um, so it, it turns out, right, after the teacher started asking, so it turns out that the kid uh, previously was asking this bot like some random questions and the bot just couldn't understand it. Um, and then the kid was so frustrated that he typed in, like, why are you so stupid? And then, <laughs> and then in response, right, in using a template, so the bot just basically replied, uh, yeah, I don't know, blah. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so do we have any questions for Keith? Uh, maybe from the floor first? Anybody? 
from his very personal stories. Okay, so one question uh, for designers. We have great responsibility. Let's say your CEO comes and say, uh, the thing you design, the suggesting is good for humans, but not good for business. What do you do in that case? Good for humans, but not good for? It's like you trying to think of your users, human being, in your design, but your CEO, your the business owner thinks the business part of it, and there's a conflict. So, responsible designer, what should we do for that? Mm. Okay, well, a very, very deep question, like going down into like the ethics of, of design. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to, to understand like, you know, where, where do humans sit in this whole ecosystem? And maybe sometimes we really need to not trust the humans because humans are very fallible. Um, and when I think about, like, say, uh, say self-driving, I, I mean, they, they always pose this question like, you know, I, I'm driving a car and then uh, either I kill myself or I kill the... The, the, the young kid crossing the road. So what, what should the bot, like, how should the bot uh, decide? I would say this, these are not very easy questions uh, to, to answer, but I think we, we do need to see like, where do humans sit within the, the larger ecosystem. Like, how, much, um, how much autonomy should we be giving these people to make decisions? And, and uh, I think there's also the whole business around it, right? Uh, I was, like, if you look at, say, the airline industry, like, autopilot, it's a very, very mature um, technology. And in fact, planes can take off and land uh, on autopilot already. But why do we still have pilots uh, inside the, the cockpit? Um, I think, like, if you think about it, if, if an accident do happen, like, who is responsible? So I think there's still the whole business, the whole insurance uh, around uh, like humans and, and, tech and, art and all these uh, artificial intelligence bots. And I think it's, it's not just a problem for design to solve alone. It's like, I think engineering needs to be in, the business side needs to be in, and I would say the answer is not so easy. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot answer your question, yeah. but uh, as much as possible, we do want to push for uh, the user experience. You know, when people use, interact with this bot, like how do we make them feel? But at the end of the day, we don't want, we don't want uh, people to just be so like, to feel alienated, to be scared, and then put this thing aside. And, and not use it uh, for what it was designed for. Okay, so can we get a question from Slido? Oh, no. Uh, the most liked question is, do you sell these red carousel t-shirts on carousel? No. Oh. But we, we, uh, if, you go to, <laughs> if you go to the carousel platform, you, uh, under, I think there's a user called carousel. We do sell some of our peripherals, like right, uh, our t-shirts and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, okay, business tip from... The one working there. Okay, himself. but ne next time if I organize the event, you come to my event, I'll give you your t-shirts. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll hold you that. Uh, we hold you to that promise. Yes. Um, next one. How can you prevent users from tagging irrelevantly on Carousel? Oh. Can you search. Uh, so actually, key keyword abuse is one of the problems we have. Um, I'm I'm not shy to admit uh, it, lah. Huh? Like if you if you look at some of the um. Uh, listings that we have. Let's say if, if I'm selling a, a Honda car, and then under the listings, you know, you got the, the guy who put Honda, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Mercedes, uh, in hoping that people can uh, uh, has more chance to uh, to discover their, their listings. So we do we do have um, a lot of. Also, one thing I didn't I didn't talk about just now is that we we do have a lot of, um, algorithms running in the background to detect abuse of keywords. Uh, abuse of accounts, um, and we we do try to uh, give everyone a score to 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 detect, you know, uh, what's the possibility of you doing some bad things, and then from there, you know, we, we will also have um, manual intervention. You know, we have people, we have moderators, we have a marketplace quality ops team to look after all these listings. Um, but I think as as we as we scale, the the human workforce also has to scale accordingly, la. Okay, so there's this one very interesting question. Um, do you think UX can be automated? If yes, then what should we do? And then there was one, um, if UX is automated, I feel threatened. So what's your response to these questions? Ah, um, <laughs> yeah, quite, quite scary, because like, now you can just create websites and then uh, like, anyone can create a website. And it's like, all template driven. And even in the, like, the experiment that I ran like, like 10, 15 years ago, 
uh, one of the tasks was to create a website uh, using a bot. Um, and, but the one was my, more towards like website maintenance. Um, I would say some tasks that we, are, that we do as designers can actually be automated. I don't see why, uh, why, I, have, why I have to design 10 different versions of that, this button. When, when it's, it's, it's just so mind-numbing. Mind uh, I wish for those things to be automated. Uh, you know, when I do something in Sketch, um, yeah, why do I have to prepare so many different versions? Like, why can't I just do one and then you, you stress test it for me in like, so many other situations? Like, uh, what if the, the, the longest name in my database, the shortest name in my database, um, or like, what if this person has two names, three names? Like, uh, if those things can be automated, like, so I don't have to think about all these different edge cases, actually, I, I feel that that will, that will really empower us to, to think of the more like, important questions uh, in our work. But then I will, I will argue that uh, it's still a long way. Like, probably not in, I, I wish it's not in our, time, in our lifetime that uh, AI can actually do creativity, um, can talk about emotions uh, as well as we do. Um, but I think when the day comes, um, then we, we will all need to retrain ourselves. Oh, as, <laughs> as being, uh, because if you think about it, uh, AI, a lot of it is garbage in, garbage out. So I've, I've trained like, a lot of AI bots uh, to look at different problems like healthcare, to look at problems like uh, counter-terrorism. And really, uh, what I realized is it's garbage in, garbage out. If I feed this bot with very, very poor quality uh, uh, data, the kind of recommendation it gives me is not, it's, it's not never going to be good. So we still have a, we still have a job to play, la, you know, to train these bots in future. Okay, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, next one, how do, uh, how do you, wow, um, wait, there's this exam question below. How do you help people build relationship with AI? Give us three insights. Wow, three, okay, I'll count. First one, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, this one really exam problem. Um, <laughs> relationship with AI. Um, okay, so uh, some time ago I, was, I, I designed something, uh, so we, we, we're thinking of building an app. Um, and then um, th I think this was this was a uh, a project that I worked on uh, when for like agriculture like farmers in India, and we through a whole series of insights and learnings we decided to abandon the idea of an app, and then we then uh, we then developed a, a call center uh, a concept to still facilitate some kind of two sided marketplace uh, someone who has a tractor and someone who wants to rent a tractor. Uh, and what we learned from what I learned from the experience is that what stay consistent, right? Whether is it an app or is it a call center, is the conversation that we have uh, between the service and the users. So I would say um, one of the one of the fundamentals that we need to we need to think about when designing a relationship with techn with technology, not just AI, is the kind of conversation that we want the users to have with that piece of technology. And it goes back to really drawing down the, the speech bubbles, you know, what, how we were designing it, we were designing it based on speech bubbles. And you work very well in the context of an app, and you also work very well in the context of a call center. Um, and I think thinking about the conversation that people have with that technology is the first step. Okay. <laughs> Second one mm -hmm. um, is then about personality. Um, we, so I've, I've worked in a different uh, few places where no, we, we, we look a lot into our brand. I know that like, as UX designers, sometimes we, we don't participate in the brand design uh, in our organization, but I will, I will encourage everyone to uh, participate in that process. And you will learn a lot about brand design. It's about who you are as a person. Like, do you want to be this um, uh, kind of rich kid, uh, just uh, very, very, um, like, very, very premium kind of uh, taste? Or do you want to be the common man? Uh, so we do, actually, I run a lot of exercises to, to ask people to imagine your brand as a person. You know, do you want to be like Lady Gaga? Do you want your brand to be like Lady Gaga? Do you want your brand to be, um, I don't know, Justin Bieber? Sorry, I, I have not enough pop culture references here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from there, you know, we, we, we think about you know, if this piece of technology were to speak, like, what would be the tone of voice be? And I think in designing that conversation, we can add a lot of quality inside, uh, inside that. And the third one? And the third one is um, uh, I would say um, testing. So like, I think it goes back to the fundamentals, you know, understanding what users need and also prototyping and, and testing. You know, 
and observing how people react with it. And I think it give, give, it, give it time because um, in the past, some of this technology that we are using feels very foreign to us. But now, you know, we, are, we are adopting it, we are embracing it, and we are, to a certain extent, like, obsessing over it, and, that, and that's our phones. Um, I think over time, we do, we do develop a relationship with it. Um, I remember in China, uh, I was in China doing some research on people's attitude towards mobile phone. I met this very interesting lady uh, who told me this story about how uh, every time she, uh, she breaks off with her boyfriend, she will buy a new phone. <laughs> and in that, in that old phone, all the messages, uh, like SMS or WhatsApp, or, or is it WeChat, all these messages are all kept intact. To her, that is like a time capsule. And she just keeps it in a drawer. Uh, <laughs> so these things take time to build. And it's, it's, it, might, it's, it might sound crazy that people have this kind of intimate relationship with a phone, but... Uh, do give it that space, I would say. All right. I think we'll take one more question from the floor. Anyone? No? You sure? Or, okay, we take one more from Slido then. Um, hmm. I think I'll let Keith pick which question he's willing to answer. <laughs> so, oh, people say second one. <laughs> Oh, um, actually, I thought this one is the most interesting, although it has negative one. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, the, the discount code, no. <laughs> uh, this, the first one, you can come chat with me after this. Um, so I'll talk about this. Um, honestly, I myself, is, I'm, I was very fascinated. Like, how can... Uh, because I, I, I work a lot in the uh, military intelligence like, domain in the past. Um, and I'm, I'm very fascinated by how technology can help us think. Uh, we, uh, it doesn't replace our thinking, but it really augments our thinking. Um, we, we think of computer as being like this giant calculator, right? If, if we don't train it to do something, you will never be able to perform those tasks. Uh, so we, have to, we, are very, we are very careful about what computers can do and versus what humans can do. Um, but in this case, so I, was, I was looking at some research from MIT uh, and Carnegie Mellon. Um, so they, they, they were able to ask, uh, so it's, you know, like you guys know of like Watson's, right? So this was in the early stages of Watson's. Um, so they were able to ask, like, will Al-Qaeda attack Singapore? And then uh, and through a whole series of reasoning, the, uh, the, the bot can tell you yes or no and with a certain amount of percentage. And, what this, and how this, uh, why it can do it is through some kind of training and some kind of model behind. No, it, it knows how to look into like, references like, uh, for, like what, are the, what are the conditions necessary for a terrorist attack. First, uh, is there some kind of ideological difference between this organization uh, and, and the, and the na national like, uh, rhetoric? Has there been cases of uh, this organization using some kind of uh, materials to attack uh, a country? And then third, has there been like, recent events that... Uh, that kind of spotlight certain, certain uh, bad things happening. Uh, so as human beings, uh, so we can come up with, with a model like that. The, I would say AI is still not that smart enough to come up with models uh, like this on the fly. Uh, and, but what AI can do, very, what computers can do very well is to search the entire universe for evidence for in, in, all this, uh, in all these buckets to, to build your model, to build the, your reasoning. Um, so it's able to tell you, oh, like, it's, he has done, like, he has used cyanide in uh, the Tokyo subway, he has done this uh, train bombing in, in Mumbai, um, and then this organization believes in this kind of ideology, and this is what happens, this is what so-and-so said at this event, uh, um, yeah, at this time, and, and then able to calculate some kind of probability score of like, whether an attack will happen or not. Um, so like, pretty, pretty amazing on, on how... Uh, analysis is done, and I would say that it, it can do it as, at a much robust level compared to human beings. All right, I think that's enough questions for now. Uh, thank you, Keith, for sharing very personal stories to uh, relay the message to the audience.